Hello everyone, um, this is Mr. Austin. Um, in this video, we will be officially starting um, unit one, uh, which is our first kind of real unit in this class. Um, and this is the first video of many different videos that we will be going through in unit one. Um, previously, we finished up unit zero and that kind of basic information about experiments um, and statistics. And so in unit one, though, our focus is now going to shift into um, some biology now and specifically the chemistry behind biology. So unit one is called the chemistry of life. And in this unit, we're going to be looking at um, the chemistry that kind of uh, powers and drives and uh, living things and um, the on a molecular level, a lot of the things that are in place and going on in, in cells and living things. And so in unit one, like many of the future units we're going to go through in this class, it's actually divided into multiple sets of notes. So in unit one, there's three different sets of, of notes you guys will get and that we'll go through. Um, this is the unit 1.1 notes. Um, there's also a unit 1.2 and a unit 1.3. Um, in unit 1.1, we're looking at some foundational chemistry that's going to, like the name suggests, set the, the foundation for um, this school year and a lot of things that we're going to be looking at. Uh, this These set of notes have different topics um, as well as the other set of notes. They have their own set of topics to kind of chunk the information. But in this video, we're going to go ahead and get started with topic one. Um, in topic one, we're going to be looking at um, basically a review, a quick recap of some important chemistry concepts that you need to be familiar with and reminded of um, to be kind of successful in this class and to understand some of the things that we're going to learn throughout this year, especially towards um, in first semester. And so uh, basically it's going to be things that hopefully sound familiar because you should have learned almost all of this stuff in regular chemistry when you took your chemistry class. Um, but that could have been a while ago or you might have forgotten a lot of it during the summer. So we're going to do a quick recap of some super important things from chemistry that are going to be very applicable in things that you're going to need to know for this class. And so, and that's, that's what we're going to do here in topic one. Um, so let's get started. Some of the stuff we can just kind of breeze through cause it's pretty straightforward. And then I'll kind of emphasize the stuff that's going to be really important for this school year. So first of all, um, when we talk about chemistry, we need to know that there's matter matter. It refers to anything that has mass and takes up space. Um, it can exist in three different states. There's solids, there's liquids, there's gases. I guess you could say there's a fourth state, state including um, plasma, plasmas, um, but even if we just focus on the fact that there's gases, solids, and liquids, um, living things, all of these states of matter are going to be applicable for, for living organisms and in biology. Um, I mean, there's gases definitely involved in biology, just think of the fact that you're breathing in oxygen right now. Um, living things are, are solid objects. Our bodies are made of, of, of solid material. Um, and there's also a lot of liquid um, inside of us. Um, living things, including humans, we're made of mostly water. There's a lot of aqueous solutions inside of our bodies and inside of our cells that we'll talk about. Um, but that's matter. Now, an element, um, this is what makes up matter. This is the simplest form of matter. And so there's a bunch of different elements. If you remember your periodic table of elements, it shows you all the elements that exist um, in the universe. Uh, in biology, there's actually not a lot of elements. Well, there kind of is a lot, but there's mostly just a handful of elements that make up our cells and our bodies and all of life on this planet. And the six main ones, the most common ones you're going to see in living things that all living thing organisms are made of, we are all made, every single living thing on this planet, from the simplest cell um, to fungi and plants and bacteria and um, animals um, and us, we are made of carbon, lots of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And those six elements actually make up 97%, um, more than 97% of our bodies. Um, and that actually is pretty consistent for all living things on this planet, even just single-celled organisms. Um, there's an acronym to remember all six of them. It's schnapps. That's how I learned it. Um, so we say that life is made of schnapps. I don't know if that helps you, but those are the seven most common ones. 
And then beyond that, there's actually a, a, um, many more elements that we find in living things that have very important roles, but just found in very small amounts. We call them trace elements, just to name a few. There's potassium and sodium and calcium and chlorine um, and a handful of others that you're going to find in our cells and in our bodies and in other living things um, on this planet. Um, and not to say that any of these are more important or less important because basically you're going to need all of them to be a functioning living thing. And so, but the six most common ones are those uh, elements there. And so here's a, some pie charts um, to break down the composition of, of, of different things on planet Earth. So if you look at living things, you guys can see that we're mostly carbon um, living things on this planet. Um, and so that's why you might have heard the term carbon-based life forms. That's that's how life exists as we know it. Um, we haven't found other forms of life that aren't carbon-based. And then there's a bunch of oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. Those are the big six, like I told you. And then there's a bunch of other ones. Um, and so we don't worry too much about those, but you will see them throughout this school year come up. Um, if you look at Earth's atmosphere, though, it's kind of interesting. Um, most of Earth's atmosphere is actually, like the air that we're breathing, is actually mostly almost 80% nitrogen gas. Um, and then the remaining of it being oxygen gas, along with a small handful of carbon dioxide and some of these other gases in our atmosphere. Um, and then if you look at Earth's crust, so the, the, the Earth that we're living on and life is living on, and inside the Earth and the Earth's crust, these are the, the elements common in the Earth's crust. And so some of this year, we'll be kind of talking about how these elements end up in living things and where they came from and where they go. Um, because these elements that are found in living things, they're not permanently going to reside inside of you. Um, especially, if, like, let's just say the fact that you're going to die one day and, like, those elements are going to go somewhere. Um, or you're acquiring new elements all the time in your body and new atoms inside of your body. And so that will be um, kind of a main concept that comes up throughout this class. Uh, anyway, these elements um, form what's called atoms, um, or these atoms are the are what make up elements. And so hopefully this is super, super basic stuff. I'm not going to focus too much on it. You don't need to know. We're not going to get into the whole structure of an atom in this class that much. It's not going to really matter. But there's, just to remind you, atoms, there's protons and neutrons in the nucleus of the atom, and then there's electrons orbiting around in these different orbitals, um, forming what's called an electron cloud. Um, it's the number of protons in the nucleus that determines what element um, an atom is. And so here's just a basic snippet of some of the information shown on the periodic table. Here's carbon. We'll talk about carbon a lot this whole year. Um, but carbon's atomic number six, that's because carbon atoms have six protons. And if you have six protons, you are carbon. Um, that's the definition of a carbon atom. You have six protons. Um, and then the mass, that's the number of protons and neutrons added together inside the nucleus. And so most of the time, the carbon that we're looking at has six protons because all carbons have six protons. And then most carbon atoms also have six neutrons as well. So six plus six adds up to 12. However, there are things called isotopes, um, which again is a word that should be very familiar with you guys. An isotope, these are atoms that, have, that are the same element, which is because they have the same number of protons, which means you're the same element. If you have six protons and he has six protons, you're both carbon. But they have a different number of neutrons. This is possible and this happens a lot with different elements. Um, and so we call those isotopes. So for example, carbon, there's actually three different isotopes that exist. Like I just described, most of the time carbon has six protons with six neutrons, which gives carbon a mass of 12 um, because the mass is the protons plus the neutrons. But there also is some carbon atoms that have six protons because they have to have six protons, but they all have, they, instead of having six neutrons, they have seven neutrons, which gives it a mass of 13. And then there's also a little bit of carbon that exists that has six protons and eight neutrons, which gives carbon, that carbon atom a mass of 14. And so these are three different isotopes of carbon. And the only thing different between them, they're all carbon, 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 carbon. They all have the same number of protons. What's different is their number of neutrons, which is going to affect their mass. So they have different masses because they have a different number of neutrons. Now, some isotopes are radioactive, meaning that they're unstable. And so a radioactive isotope is one that's going to decay um, over time, which means um, at some point in the future, either really, really soon or a long, long time from now, 
that atom, that isotope, that radioactive isotope is going to change in a way to become um, a different atom slightly. Um, and so that's what it means to, when an isotope is radioactive. It means that it's at some point in the future, it's going to be different. That atom is going to look different. Um, sometimes it loses protons or neutrons and it, it changes, or sometimes it can even change what element it is. Um, so that's an unstable or radioactive isotope. And so for carbon, carbon-14 is actually radioactive. So carbon-14, if you have a carbon-14 atom in your hand, at some point in the future, it's not going to stay carbon-14. It actually becomes nitrogen um, because um, it actually one of its neutrons becomes a proton, don't worry about it, but it, it changes, the composition of that atom changes. Um, and it takes on average thousands of years actually for that carbon-14 to change, but it will change, it's not stable. Um, and so we say that carbon-14 is radioactive. There are some uses of isotopes in biology. So the reason I bring this up is there's a couple different uses you need to know for this class. So radioactive isotopes especially, specifically have many uses in science. One of them is um, they have half-lives which is another thing that should sound familiar. Um, and we can use the half-life of certain isotopes to determine the age of, uh, of fossils that we find of once living organisms or rock layers in the earth um, or other relics that we're trying to figure out um, how old they are. And that's a process called radioactive dating where we're gonna uh, look at a specific radioactive isotope in that, um, that thing we found and um, use its half-life to estimate how old that thing is. And so every radioactive isotope has a different half-life. Half-life, just to give you the definition to remind you, that's the amount of time it takes for a sample of radioactive isotopes to decay into, um, for it, it takes for uh, to decay into more stable isotopes. Um, and specifically, it's it's the amount of time. I guess there might be a typo here. The amount of time it takes for a sample of radioactive isotope. It should say it's the amount of time it takes for half a sample of radioactive isotopes to decay into a more stable isotopes. So for example, if you have 10 grams of carbon-14 in your hand, um, at some point, you'll some of those carbon-14s, like I said, are going to change and no longer be carbon-14. And there's going to be a point where you're now going to only have five grams left of carbon-14. And that amount of time that it took for half of that 10 grams to now decay into something else, that's the half-life. And for carbon-14, the half-life is actually 5,730 years, which means every 5,730 years, half of the carbon-14 you have is going to now be gone. And then again, another 5,730 years, half of what you had is now gonna be gone. And so that's what radioactive decay looks like. And we can scientists can use that to kind of estimate um, how old things are. So for example, if a, a scientist finds a, a bone, a fossil of a bone that um, is contains two and a half grams of carbon-14, and then using their fancy analysis and mathematical reasoning, they, they figure out and calculate that when that organism was alive, it had 10 grams. There, sh there would have been 10 grams of carbon-14 in that, that bone, um, but now there's only two and a half. And so they can kind of backtrack how many half-lifes occurred. So they would know that that would be two half-lifes ago if you had two and, two and a half grams, then two half-lifes ago, it would have had 10 grams, which would be 5,730 years and then another 5,730 years. And so that would be 11,460 years. And they could say, okay, well, this organism was alive 11,000 years ago. Um, luckily for this class, you don't really need to do half-life calculations like you did in chemistry, but that's the gist behind it so that you kind of understand the concept behind it. Um, and then another use of radioactive isotopes in biology is, and this will come up multiple times throughout the year, is that we can use radioactive isotopes as tracers in biological molecules, which is going to allow scientists to monitor and investigate different biological processes and the molecules involved in those processes. And so what a tracer is, this is probably something you haven't learned, um, but we'll talk about this throughout the year. A tracer is when you take a molecule and then you actually synthesize that molecule um, with a certain radioactive isotope attached to that um, molecule. So we say that that molecule is now labeled because you made it radioactive with a certain atom that you added to that molecule. Um, and so now we can actually track that molecule because we have equipment, there's devices and fancy scientific equipment that can track where the radioactivity ends up. 
And so we might not be able to see molecules, but we can measure where there's radioactivity. And so when you take a molecule and you make it radioactive, we call that labeling it, radioactively labeling it, it's now a tracer. We can trace it. We can track where that molecule ends up. Um, and so here's an example. Um, I'll actually just skip to this page here that kind of walks you through. This is actually an example that you guys will forget, but it's actually going to come up in unit five next semester. Um, this is an experiment that we have to learn about. But here's the gist. Basic, this is a real experiment that was done in the 1950s, I think. Um, famous experiment. Um, don't have to worry too much about it right now. But basically what they're doing is they're taking viruses, which in this case are called phages, which is a virus. And these viruses um, or phages, they um, infect bacteria cells. So here's a bacteria cell and this virus is going to infect that bacteria cell. And scientists wanted to know what is the virus infecting the bacteria cell with? Like what is the, when, uh, when a virus is infecting a bacteria cell, what are they actually giving the bacteria cell? And they figured it was one of two things. It was either the proteins that make up the, there's the virus. So the virus is made of a bunch of protein. And they, uh, one, one thing they thought is that the viruses, when they infect bacteria cells, they, that they're going to give the bacteria cell their, their proteins. And then another thing that they thought it could be was their DNA. So these viruses contain DNA. Um, and then that was another idea. They think that, okay, when these viruses infect bacteria cells, maybe they're giving those bacteria cells their DNA. So they set up this experiment where they're going to label, radioactively label the virus's proteins um, by using a certain radioactive element. Um, and they're going to cause the proteins of this virus to become radioactive. And then they're going to let it infect bacteria cells. And then they're going to look at the bacteria cells. They're going to analyze the bacteria cells and see if there's radioactivity inside those bacteria cells. And what they found is that there was no radioactivity inside the, the bacteria cells, which means those radioactive proteins that they labeled, making them radioactive, they did not inside, end up inside the bacteria cells. That's what they were able to figure out when they did this experiment, because if they did, then the bacteria cells should become radioactive. Now, when they, they did the same thing again in a second trial, but this time they radioactively labeled the DNA of these viruses. So they made the DNA radioactive. They let them infect these bacteria cells. And what they found is when they look and analyze those bacteria cells after this, they were infected, they found that the bacteria cells did become radioactive. And that told them, that allowed them to figure out that the viruses were infecting the bacteria cells with their DNA. And they were able to do that by tracking the, the DNA by making it radioactive and seeing where that radioactivity ends up. So that's another use of, of, of radioactive isotopes. We call them tracers. Um, moving on with some chemistry that you should have learned and maybe forgot. Um, there's compounds. Compounds are when different elements um, come together and chemically bond together to form um, larger pieces or, or what we call compounds like water H2O, CO2, NaCl, C6H12O6, that's glucose. And so atoms bond together in order to gain a full valence shell. Let me plug in my computer real quick before it dies. Elements can chemically bond together and they do that because they want a full valence shell. If you guys remember like the octet rule, um, meaning that, uh, which refers to the fact that elements have a certain number of valence electrons, which are the electrons in their outer energy shell. And um, they want to get to eight. So if when they bond with each other, they can bond in certain ways with each other that allow them to gain eight valence electrons. We're not going to focus on this too much, um, but that does, there's basically two types of chemical bonds that allow atoms to gain a full valence shell. Um, and so these will kind of come up throughout the year. There's ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are when atoms transfer electrons to one another and become ions, and which are positively and negatively charged atoms. So for example, Na and Cl, sodium and chlorine, what they do is sodium actually gives up his valence electron and gives it to chlorine. And when he does that, sodium becomes positively charged and chlorine becomes negatively charged. We call these ions. And now they form an ionic bond. Now they're attracted to each other and they stick together. Um, just know that they're transferring electrons and becoming charged, positive and negative. 
Now, covalent bonds are a lot different. This is when um, atoms share electrons with each other. They don't transfer electrons, they're gonna share electrons. So this hydrogen and this oxygen, they're gonna share, he's gonna share one of his valence electrons, he's gonna share one of his valence electrons, and them now sharing that pair of electrons forms a covalent bond between them, and they're gonna stay together now. Same thing with this hydrogen and oxygen. So when you have these two hydrogens, each sharing a pair of valence electrons with oxygen, it forms water. And so those are covalent bonds, holding them together when they're sharing electrons. Now ionic compounds, which are made up of ions because they transferred electrons to each other, they're positive and negative. Um, these are generally known as salts, like table salt, like sodium chloride, but just generally known as salts. Now um, these ions, like I said, um, uh, what's important to know about this is that when the ionic compounds are placed in water, um, those ions will, we say that ionic compounds will dissociate um, when they're placed in um, water. Most of the time, ionic compounds will dissociate. And that means that water will actually come in and start separating these ions from one another in that compound, which is going to cause that compound to then dissolve in the water. Like if you put salt in water, it's going to dissolve. And that's because all these ions are going to separate because these water molecules, that's these guys, they're going to come here and separate all these ions from one another. Um, and so in biology throughout this school year, we're going to talk about ions a lot. Um, and in living things and cells, since we're made of mostly water and even cells are made of a lot of water, um, a lot of times we're going to see ions because they're dissolved in the water. Um, now covalent compounds, these are generally called molecules. So when you hear the word molecules, we're talking about covalent compounds usually. And again, that's when atoms are sharing electrons and they're, they're forming these, these molecules. Um, sugar is a good example. Um, it's just a bunch of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens all bonded together with covalent bonds, sharing electrons. Now, covalent compounds, they don't dissociate when you put them in water. So when they're exposed to water, these atoms do not separate from each other. So these covalent bonds don't break. They stay together, okay? They do not break. These atoms, these individual atoms do not break apart in water. Um, but they can still dissolve in water because what the water does is it doesn't separate the, the atoms from each other within the molecule, but it separates each molecule from the other molecules. So like here's a sugar molecule and the water is going to um, start breaking it apart from other sugar molecules. But in that sugar molecule, all those atoms are still bonded together with covalent bonds. So water can't break those covalent bonds. In fact, what's important to know for this class maybe is that in order for covalent bonds to be broken, it's going to require a chemical reaction. Chemical reactions are needed to actually break these bonds between the atoms. Um, and so if photosynthesis is a, a, a great example of a chemical reaction that we're gonna be talking about in this class, um, where carbon dioxide and water molecules are, are gonna be used by plants and become oxygen and glucose molecules, sugar molecules. And that's gonna involve these atoms, these bonds, these covalent bonds between them being broken and then reforming into new covalent bonds that form new molecules. And you can only do that with a chemical reaction. And we'll talk about chemical reactions a lot throughout this year. Um, and so moving on to a few more things here in these notes. Again, we're trying to do a quick refresher of your entire year of chemistry. Um, focusing on the highlights that are important for this class. Um, this gets really important now. If, if there was, the, if I had to pick the most important thing from these notes, it's this right here for these next couple slides. And so molecules um, like sugar and water, these molecules that have covalent bonds, these uh, molecules can be classified as either polar molecules or nonpolar molecules. This should sound a little familiar, but what that means is there's there's some molecules where the atoms are sharing electrons <clears throat> and they're sharing the electrons equally. So no one's hogging the electrons. Um, everyone's sharing the electrons equally, which um, creates a situation where there's not going to be a partial positive or a partial negative region on the molecule anywhere. And so if that doesn't make a lot of sense, just if you don't remember that, we don't have time to go through why, but just know that in nonpolar molecules, they're sharing electrons equally, which means that in a nonpolar molecule, there's no positive or negative regions on the molecule because everyone's sharing electrons equally. So all those negative electrons, they're all 
kind of being dispersed evenly. So there's not a, a part of these molecules that's overall negative or positive. A good example are fats and oils, which we'll talk about in the next set of notes um, soon in this class. But fats and oils, those are nonpolar molecules. Um, they don't have charged areas on their molecules. Now, polar molecules this is the opposite. This is when atoms, they are molecules, they are sharing electrons with each other, but they're not sharing electrons equally, which means that some of those electrons are gonna be focused or concentrated on one side of the molecule or one area of the molecule, which is gonna make that area more negatively charged and other areas more positively charged. And so this is gonna create what we call partial charges. There's gonna be partial positive and partial negative regions on the molecule. Water is a great example that you should be familiar with from your chemistry class. But water, this molecule, oxygen and hydrogen, like I explained earlier, they're sharing a pair of electrons, but they're not sharing equally. Oxygen's hogging those electrons, and so the electrons are hanging out near oxygen and not so much near hydrogen, which makes this side of the molecule more negative and this side of the molecule more positive. That's what we call a polar molecule. You can kind of see it in this diagram as well. And so anytime you have a polar molecule, that means we're talking about a molecule that has positive and negative areas on it. Just, just know that. Um, which then leads, again, to another important slide, this idea of like dissolves like, um, and these two words called hydrophobic and hydrophilic. And so polar substances, which, um, and fully charged substances such as ion, any substance that has charged areas, like ions, for example, they're positively charged or negatively charged, um, but also polar molecules, like I just said, they have positive and negative regions. Anything that has charges on it, full charges or partial charges, they're going to like other substances that have charges. So polar substances like other polar substances because they have positive and negative regions, and then these guys have positive and negative regions, and in the universe, positive and negative regions like each other. So they like to mingle up and they like to mix with each other. And so they will actually um, mix and dissolve in one another, polar substances and other polar substances. Um, whereas nonpolar substances, substances that don't have any charged areas, they are going to like to, they're gonna like to be with other nonpolar substances that don't have any charges. Um, and they're gonna kind of stay away from things that do have charges because they have no attraction to them. So if I have this guy over here who has positive and negative charges, and then I have this guy who doesn't have any positive or negative charges, it's kind of like magnets. Like they're not gonna, there's nothing attracting them to each other. But if you have two magnets, like this guy who has positive and or negative charges, and this guy who has positive and or negative charges, they're gonna want, like magnets, they're gonna like each other, okay? And so um, a lot of times when we're looking at cells and biology and living things, which are composed mostly of water inside of us, um, this becomes really important because water, like I said, is polar. Water is polar. And water is going to love other things that are polar or have charges, just like he has charges. Anything else that has charges, water is going to love. Now, substances that like water and mix with water, we call that hydrophilic. So hydrophilic is any um, substance that likes to, to mix and dissolve in water and likes to associate and be around water. So hydrophilic literally means water loving. Um, and so ions, for example, ions have positive and negative charges. And like I said earlier, water loves that. Water is all up in that business, okay? Water loves these positive and negative charges. We say that ions are hydrophilic. They, they love water. And other polar substances, if you have other polar substances, they're also gonna like water because water is polar, okay? Um, so polar molecules and ions, these are hydrophilic. They love water. Now, nonpolar molecules, when you try to put nonpolar molecules with water, it doesn't, they're not very compatible. Nonpolar substances don't like to be around water because they have no attraction to water because they don't have any charged areas. And so we say that they're hydrophobic. They do not like to interact or mix with or touch water. So oil, like I said earlier, oil is a, um, a nonpolar molecule. And when you put oil in water, like it doesn't want to mix. You can try to mix it as much as you want, but they actually will separate from each other. Like they don't, they, those molecules don't like water molecules. So this is super critical that you memorize this as soon as possible in this class, because it's gonna come up a lot, like a lot, a lot, like the whole year, 
okay? Hydrophobic, hydrophilic, polar, nonpolar. So all you guys need to know, memorize this right now, is that polar molecules and ions, so I have a molecule that's polar, I have ions. They are hydrophilic. They like water. They like water, okay? Because they have charged areas. They're charged. Nonpolar molecules, molecules that don't have any charged areas, so nonpolar things, they are hydrophobic. They don't like water. Memorize that, okay? Um, and then these notes end with this, um, this idea that, um, or not this idea, but the, the fact that molecules take on specific three-dimensional shapes, especially the molecules that we're going to examine and see in this class in biology. Um, and they have three-dimensional shapes. So molecules exist in a three-dimensional world and they take on some unique shapes sometimes. And in biology, the shape of a molecule is actually gonna be really important for how it interacts with other molecules inside of our cells and inside of our bodies and in all living things. And so the shape of molecules, which we're gonna get into a lot, is really, it's gonna have a, a big important impact in this class and um, in how those molecules, what those molecules are doing in, in living things. It's all about the shape for a lot of these molecules. And so here's a good example. This is um, a molecule, this is an, an, a molecule called endorphin. This endorphin is a hormone that your body um, creates. Um, it gives you a sense of happiness and pleasure. So endorphins are, we like that feeling. Um, excitement even. Um, uh, adrenaline is, is, is actually an endorphin. And so when you're all excited or on a roller coaster or you're feeling really good, like those are a bunch of endorphins pumping through your body. And this is the shape of that molecule. Now this is actually a drug called morphine. Um, and this is, um, not naturally made in your guys' bodies, this molecule, but we do use it as a, a drug, um, and it's prescribed to people sometimes. Um, and if you guys notice, there's an area of this molecule and this molecule that are exactly the same shape. Um, and that causes morphine when it's inside your body to trick your body into thinking it's endorphins, because this part actually is the most important part in your cells, this this part right here of the endorphin molecule. And since this guy is like sneaky and matching that, it tricks your cells to thinking that this guy is an, an endorphin when actually it's morphine. And so the reason that is, is because there's these receptors in your guys' bodies and in your cells that, um, and in your brain, these receptors bind to endorphin molecules because they're supposed to when endorphins are released in your body, they bind to them at this spot right here. This part of the molecule is what binds to that receptor. And coincidentally, morphine has that exact same thing, structure, that shape that can bind to the same receptor. So your body thinks there's endorphins in your body when it's actually just this drug. Um, but anyway, that's it for topic one. That's a big topic in these notes. Um, so sorry if that was kind of long. That's um, basically most of the main chemistry things that you need to kind of have fresh in your mind for this class. Um, but that's it. Thank you guys.